I stopped playing Pal World after about 15 hours. And I'm gonna be totally honest, I'm genuinely worried about what this spells out for the gaming industry. The game very clearly wears its inspiration on its sleeve, and at some point you could probably call it just a straight up ripoff. And while I enjoyed what I played, there's just something about it that rubs me the wrong way. But this is an all encompassing review slash impressions of Pal World, because I want to talk about the actual game itself, you know, what it does good, what it does bad, and where I kind of hope it goes in the future. But also talking about, you know, the actual future of this game, like will it get struck down due to copyright? Will Nintendo go after it? And also there's some questionable things about AI, and in general just stealing stuff, so there's a lot to talk about with this game. As a game, Pal World takes heavy inspiration from, you know, a couple of games. First of all, there's the survival elements of the game, which mostly come from, I would say, Ark. You know, there's obviously other games like Valheim, Terraria, Minecraft, them sorts of games. Where, you know, you spawn on an island, you punch down some trees, you pick up some stone, you make some spears, you make some pickaxes. You get the picture and then you start to go into building bases. And that's where I think you can see that Pal World takes inspiration from everything and kind of melds them all together. So it has that arc part. And then you look at the Breath of the Wild inspiration or the Sonic Frontiers inspiration, where the game has this weird sort of super realistic world with a very tranquil atmosphere. It even has very similar UI elements where when you discover a new location, you know, a little jingle plays and the name of the place flashes up on the screen. And yes, Sonic Frontiers takes a lot of inspiration from Breath of the Wild. But where I think this game takes the most inspiration from Sonic Frontiers, and this is where, you know, probably the one thing from Sonic Frontiers that realistically you wouldn't want to take, is that it's almost like they built two different games. They built a chibi, cute, anime-style game with these characters, and then they build a super realistic world and they just smash them on top of each other and they just don't fit. I think this game in general is lacking some cohesion where when you see these realistic mountains or these realistic ruins, and then you see this like very colorful anime character running around or very colorful pal running around on top of them, they just don't meld together. And I think that's where this game fails the most. Now, where it doesn't fail though, is that it does a pretty good job at melding the gameplay mechanics together. So at first glance, you're thinking, this is Pokemon with guns. And yes, to some extent it is Pokemon with guns, but they've actually introduced the pals into the game in a way that they're not just used for battling. Yes, they are used for battling. They're used for, you can fly them, you can ride on them to, to traverse the world, but also they're used in automating your base, which I think is really smart. And it's a system that I really enjoyed where you have your base and you want them to mine stone or you want them to harvest some wood or even craft stuff for you. And every single pal has a different skill. So one pal will be good at chopping down trees. One pal will be good at breaking stone or one pal will be good at crafting stuff. And as you upgrade your base, you can put more pals in it. You have to look after their, their happiness as well, by giving them food and giving them beds and also like recreation because some of them like go on strike and it's very weird I think if if PETA had a problem with Pokemon they're gonna really have a problem with this because you're putting your pals to work my pals are mining they're chopping down trees they're crafting stuff for me and they're just working very hard but I do like that system because it you know it gives a different it gives you something to do outside of just battling with these pals which I think it's a really good system. But when exploring the world and sort of engaging in combat, that's where the game gets, you know, again, quite clever. Where you can see this is Breath of the Wild. You're exploring this very tranquil world. You're going to these towers to fight bosses and you're finding shrines. Basically, you are finding the exact same shrines. There are, there are effigies of a certain pal that you bring to a statue that's in a broken down church. So yeah, this game really has no shame. You know exactly where it's getting its inspiration from. And in the battling also is probably the coolest implementation of the pals so the pals in general super powerful i have this big flying guy that shoots out all these massive fireballs and you know he's super super powerful but when you're riding on like a flying pokemon or pal you can actually use them as almost like a turret where i can use all of their abilities when i'm on their back which is really cool turns them into like a third person shooter but then you get these things you can craft and this is where the game becomes really fun because I had this Firefox. I forget the name of the, the, the pal. I don't know any of the names of the pals because I'll get into that later. They're all very generic. But you have this fire pal and he's a fox and you build a harness. And what that harness lets you do is pick him up, hold him over under your shoulder and use him as a flamethrower. <laughs> and then there's one where I have this monkey where I can uh, use, his, use his ability that I crafted 
that he whips out an assault rifle and just starts shooting people. But in that and base automation, you know, that's where the pals are at their best. Now, ultimately, I did just sort of give up because I put 15 hours into it. I caught about 50% of the pals. I fought one of the four major bosses and it just felt very samey. I had unlocked sort of ways to automate making my spheres, which are how you capture things, and automating mining and automating getting stone and wood. And eventually it just kind of like became a bit you know, very samey. I was going to a new area, maybe finding four or five new pals that I would capture. And yeah, you know, there, there is a very big skill tree and you're getting new weapons, you're getting guns, you're getting useful sort of things that you can build in your base. But, you know, I will wait for more updates. And I think this game is more just sort of like a proof of concept that this can work. And I hope that in the future it gets updates. That is assuming it doesn't get taken down by Nintendo or, you know, something shady doesn't happen. Because this is where we get in to the more controversial part of this game. And this is the part where I hope everyone stayed for. Because this game borderline steals. And also potentially uses AI to make a lot of the pals. Which is, that that hasn't been confirmed. But the CEO of Pocket Pair, the, the company that made this game, did have plenty of tweets in support of AI. And me personally, now, you know, you do whatever you want. But me personally, I do not want AI in my games. Now when talking about stealing, of course, the thing that's gonna jump out, the elephant in the room, is that a lot of these pals look very, very similar to Pokemon, or at the very least, if they don't look like the Pokemon, they look like they took elements from multiple Pokemon and mashed them into one. And on one hand, I think this game is almost a parody. I think they knew exactly what they were doing in their marketing, that this is Pokemon with guns, and they were using very similar designs to sort of, you know, catch people's eyes. Now on the actual legalities of it, there's a guy called Hoglaw that runs this YouTube channel called Virtual Legality, where he goes into the sort of legal stuff around, you know, movies and games, and very good channel if, if you're interested in it. But he put out a quick tweet saying that, basically, anybody can sue anybody for anything, but, you know, it's whether or not they're going to win. And in his eyes, you know, it, it will be a difficult case for Nintendo to win. He never said if they could or couldn't win, but he just said it would be a very difficult case. And in my eyes, how I look at this is that when something is truly a copyright infringement, it gets shut down before it even comes out. I mean, if I just think of, I remember there was a, I know there's a different company, but there was a Middle Earth mod being made for Skyrim and they released a trailer or some screenshots or something and instantly wb i think it was wb who owned the rights at the time came in and shut it down and i think now i'm no law expert i did study a bit of law but i'm, I'm no law expert i think that if nintendo wanted to fight this they probably would have fought it when the trailers were out so that they could they could squash it before it comes out but you know we, we'll have to wait and see how that develops but the company that made this game pocket pair have a pretty weird history so if you look at their previous games, they're firstly all early access games, and they have been getting regular updates. They released a game called Craftopia. And if you watch the trailer for Craftopia, the introduction is the exact same as Breath of the Wild. You walk up these stone steps, you walk out, and then you're looking over a vista. And it's very blatant, but by all accounts, that game still gets updates. And you know, it's pretty fine, but once again, it just wears its heart on its sleeve. And then obviously Pal World is a kind of Pokemon arc blend, which I think is where they're probably getting away with it, where if this was a turn-based or even an action RPG where you just caught Pokemon and you didn't do base building, then maybe it could have been something else. But the fact that they're taking elements from Arc and they're taking elements from Breath of the Wild, they're taking elements from Pokemon, they're taking elements from Sonic Frontiers, they're taking elements from a lot of games and melding them all into one, it probably just muddies the water a bit, where they're definitely like, you know, they're transforming all the different elements that they're not essentially stealing because you can't exactly steal a concept. Like you can't just say like, oh, we built not knocking down a tree to, to get to get wood to build a base. You can't do that. So that's that's just how, how it is. They've released a trailer for another game that surfaced recently because obviously Pal World blew up called Nevergrave. And this game looks exactly like Hollow Knight, but I believe it's like it has roguelike elements but also it has a Mario Odyssey style where you kill an enemy, you can, you know, throw your cap on them, not exactly, but essentially throw your cap on them and then possess them and use them for whatever abilities they have. So again, I think that's where they're sort of, you know, they're grabbing this element from this game, this element from this game, meld them together and it's fine. But when it comes to stealing from, I understand Hollow Knight is a massive game made millions, you know, they're not exactly a small indie studio anymore, you know, they're very, very wealthy. But when it comes to stealing stuff from, say, Pokemon, 
I feel a bit different about it because, I mean, you know, it's the biggest multimedia franchise in the world. It's, I don't want to say a victimless crime, but it kind of is. But when you start to rob from indie games, I think it gets a bit more questionable. And yes, I understand I'm making up rules as I go along, but that's just that's just how I feel about it in my head. I'd love to know how you feel. Right? Like, do you have an allegiance to Pokemon where you would feel like annoyed or do you just have a blanket rule that, you know, kind of stealing, which is a very strong word that we can't fully understand yet unless there's any legal battles because if there's a legal battle then that will you know decide whether or not it's stealing or not but do you think it's stealing and how would you feel if they were stealing from pokemon or if they were stealing from a smaller game like i don't know like g give me another pokemon game like coromon or temtem or one of those smaller games would that change your opinion or are you generally just like no you know they're stealing from one company it's no different to steal from another you know i, I just i'd like to know what you think about that you know stealing from a massive company is one thing but using AI kind of rubs me the wrong way. And I'm going to start with this analogy. If someone feeds you a steak and you absolutely love the steak, you're like, that was absolutely delicious. And then you ask them, what was it made of? And then they go, oh, dog. And then you get disgusted. I think you are totally within your right to be disgusted by that. And that's exactly how I feel about Pal World. Because while it hasn't been confirmed that this game uses AI, there were some pretty concerning tweets about the CEO of Pocket Pair who a couple of years ago made some tweets about how they made AI generated Pokemon and how if you look at the difference between AI generated Pokemon and Pokemon themselves, it's hard to tell the difference of what is real and what is fake. And this one probably sparked the most controversy because of course they're making a Pokemon like game and they're using designs that are very, very similar to Pokemon. And when you compare some of these pals to their Pokemon counterparts, it wouldn't surprise me, now again, this hasn't been confirmed, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were made by AI. If they fed some AI art thing, make me a pal that looks like insert Pokemon here, but isn't exactly insert Pokemon here. And that's what some of the pals look like. Now there's other things taken as in, sometimes they're meldings, sometimes... They are from other things, like the first boss kind of looks like my neighbor Totoro and he's yellow and he has a black uh, a black lightning bolt across his chest. So he looks kind of, you know, again, loads of inspiration from different places. And I think even if these were made by artists, a lot of them are very uninspired. Now, I think in general, you are fighting an uphill battle going up against Pokemon because we have so much nostalgia for all these Pokemon that any game or any franchise, like even Digimon, it was had quite a, you know, quite a history, or Coromon, or any of these sort of Pokemon-like things, I just look at them like, you're not Charizard, you're not Squirtle, you're not Piplup, you're not Lucario, and it's an uphill battle for them to fight, because I just have an inherent bias in me to like these Pokemon designs, that's just how it works. And this is where it sort of spells out bad stuff for the industry, I know this is almost a bit of a knee-jerk reaction because we don't have any confirmation if this was made by AI or not, maybe someday that will come out, but I mean if this is made by AI and seeing the reaction of people, and I've seen plenty of reactions from loads of different people on Twitter and all that, for other games just having conversation about AI and how they don't really care about, oh if, if a game is really good and AI made it then why should I care, it's like, I think you're missing the point there, again, I'm never going to judge anybody. If you want to play games made by AI and you have no problem with that, that's fair enough. But if even if there's an inkling of AI being made, specifically when it comes to art, I think there's a different conversation to be had when you're talking about almost AI tools to help like improve an engine or AI to sort of bug test or AI to almost speed up mechanical processes, if you get me, things that take time as opposed to, you know, an AI writing a story or an AI making art, because I think at the end of the day, that's the thing that separates us from robots and pretty much every single other animal in this world is that we, like, they are called the humanities for a reason. And I think once we lose that, especially in games, because I consider games an art form, not many, well, a lot of people do, but, you know, it's definitely the medium that people consider the least when talking about art. But I think... If so many people are okay with having AI in their games, that's that's fine. But I personally don't like it. I don't want AI in my games. And as I said about the dog analogy, like it left a sour taste in my mouth, even knowing that this could potentially be made by, by AI. And it even goes down to the finals, okay? This is a bit of a, you know, a non sequitur, I guess, but 
I love the finals. I've played it for like 50 hours. But every time I hear those AI announcers and you can hear that certain words are spliced together or they like elongate a syllable where like a normal sort of speaking tone wouldn't elongate that syllable. Every time I hear that, I'm like, I don't like it. And even if Pal World becomes a 10 out of 10 game in, in the, the realm of survival games, and if it ever does get proven that this is made by AI, I will be, I don't know, worried. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I am part of the problem. I, I bought the game. I gave them my money. I played it. I'm going to talk about it now. But I would love to know what you think. Like, specifically, specifically about the potential use of AI in games. And uh, yeah, goodbye. Subscribe. <laughs>